Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Reggie. I uh, am going to be talking about multi-threaded architecture today. Who am I? Um, so I'm an alumni uh, from DigiPen. I'm a server engineer at Kickstarter right now in San Francisco, where I'm remoting from. Uh, I have some currency experience, mostly in uh, actor model languages, um, using game servers. And then my senior project was a task management framework. And uh, like many people, you know, I'm still learning this, so not everything I like, the main way to do it, or like even the best way to do it. So I'm just trying to give you like what I feel uh, my current experience has taught me. And, and I'm a protection nerd like this. Okay, the architectures I'm going to talk about today are uh, the render thread, the sync task system, and I was going to talk about actor model, uh, but the more I optimized the actor model, the more it just felt like a task system, so I kind of just decided to relabel this as an async task system because in the end I feel like it's a better fit for the game client, uh, despite like some initial feelings I had towards it. Okay, so oh, first one, render thread. So this is just a dual thread architecture. Your render thread, of your main thread. Uh, the big thing with this is that multi-threaded rendering doesn't really work any other way besides a render thread architecture with pre-DirectX 11 technology. And this is because uh, the DirectX device can't be used across different threads from the one it was created on, and it can be separated from the window message pump. So that's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, but what's kind of cool is once you split up the graphics thread from the main thread, all your graphics stuff, including resource loading, is happening on this other thread. So you almost kind of get resource loading for free once you set the whole thing up. Uh, so obviously there's a bunch of ways to do this. Um, the two that I kind of like have heard of, at least vaguely, is a double buffering, where you sync with the main thread every loop, and um, you have two buffers that contain transform data that's shared between the main thread and the render thread. The render thread reads the transform data the thread writes to it. And uh, every frame, swap those and you synchronize. With triple buffering, you have kind of a pivot buffer. And what's kind of cool about this is that you don't actually have to synchronize per frame because the main thread and the render thread can just swap buffers whenever they're ready in their own kind of respective frames. So that's kind of the one I'm going to be focusing on because I, I think it's kind of a little bit cooler. Um, so why do we even have to, do, why is this even a problem? Like why can't we just put graphics on a thread and then the main thread uh, separately just writes to data and graphics read from it? Well the problem with this is that it's actually not safe to read data that could be simultaneously written to because you could have partial updates to your data. Um, and the danger here is not always present it's really, can your libraries handle like some like messed up data? Generally, you just don't even wanna go that route out of even trying it because it'll probably lead to some awkward corruption visually in some way or another. And it could, it's probably, it's definitely gonna screw up stuff like um, physics data if you were trying to separate those two. So yeah. We're just being safe and we're uh, avoiding reading and writing to the same day at the same time. All right, so uh, I kind of already described this. Um, yeah, we have, we have the multiple uh, shared buffers and that's what we're using to actually do our data sharing. So, um, now the way that the main thread is going to be accessing the sh shared data from um, both the main thread and from the graphics thread is we're going to have these handles to the data. Uh, it's, it's sort of it's just like a normal sort of slot map system. 
Um, and when you use the handle index, your index expands the array of uh, transform data, and you're either setting some data or you're reading the data. What's kind of cool about this setup is generally your shared data is going to be this sort of pod struct format. So you don't have to do a complex slot map. You can just sort of do an unordered array and just swap things in and out to like uh, remove and add. Uh, this is something that I, read, I think Trev talked about in his architecture talk is the unordered array thing. Um, oh, but entity destruction is a really dangerous thing here, and you have to be very careful with it because you can't just remove from one place or the other. You have to do kind of a soft remove from the main thread. So the main thread is unlinking it from any lists that it might be in where it's being updated. And now the render thread has to just be notified, hey, make the final delete call here. And the render thread will be the final say in destroying objects. Um, let's see. Oh, and, and this is kind of important. So the reason that we can't just do a simple buffer swap when we're using double buffering, because it seems like intuitive that it might work, that you have one writer buffer and one reader buffer, and you can just swap them. The problem is, is that the render thread never knows, or, or sorry, if the main thread is doing the swapping of these buffers, it never knows if the render thread is actually ready for the buffer swap to occur. And that's why with the double buffering, we end up with that sync. Because the render thread, if it's not ready, you could be swapping, and it could be in the middle of drawing things, which would be bad. So I got a little visual here about how the uh, triple buffering thing works. So we got the main thread and the render thread, and three buffers. Um, right now, if you look at it, there's the blue and the green. So main thread is right now referencing buffer A, while the render thread is referencing buffer C, and buffer B is being referenced by no one. Now, when the main thread finishes its frame, it's going to swap its pointer to buffer A and B. So now it's referencing the, the pivot, essentially. And now, uh, when it does this swap, it's going to have to then copy the wolf work that it had done in buffer A into uh, buffer B. The reason is is because otherwise you lose coherent your data because you just made changes and now you swapped to an old buffer. So you've got to move all those kind of deltas across. And the cheapest way to do that is mem copying, but you could do some more clever delta tricks possibly. Uh, let's see. And now this is where the render thread. Let's go back to this point. So we saw that the render thread was referencing buffer C, and now the pivot has kind of changed to buffer A. So the render thread is going to have to swap with that one. And now uh, the render thread can do this on its own time. So the render thread does all its rendering, hits the end of its uh, uh, frame, essentially, and, and that's when it decides to swap. But it will only swap if it sees that the main thread's data is stale, or rather, if it assumes it, 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 it's got a dirty flag, essentially. And you just don't want to swap your buffers unless that dirty flag is set, because there's just no point. It's just you're, you're wasting a um, synchronization that has to happen here, actually. And it's, I, I'm sorry, it's not a, it's not a, a actual a synchronization barrier like the double buffering, but we do have to do a tiny synchronization. I'll talk about that in just a second. So. When swapping buffers, you, we have to use interlock exchange when setting the pivot point. And this is very important because interlock exchange, what it's essentially doing is locking that inner. So imagine a fine grain, fine grain lock happening on that um, pointer set. Now, the reason that we have to do this is because. If the pivot, well, the reason we have to do it is memory ordering, really, because if, if we just set it without an interlock exchange, we don't have any guarantee as to when that write will become available on the opposite thread. And if the pivot is out of date, if the pivot pointer is out of date, then 
the main thread can see the old pivot pointer and when it stops, it will be reading it what the render thread is, or it'll be writing what the render thread is reading from, which is like the exact opposite of what we want to happen, and that's very bad. Um, now, in order to communicate other things to the render thread besides just like swapping what transforms it's working on, we can just use like a simple message queue, just throw a critical section on a standard queue, and like do you know, your normal uh, base class message, inherit off it for different message types, and, and uh, that's actually really fast and, and really cheap. So what are the pros and cons? Pros, it's obviously, this is a relatively simple thing to implement. Um, and I mean, the biggest benefit is that though you have some complexity, once you do this, it leads to massive performance increase almost 100% of the time. And that's because normally our games have just very heavy graphics uh, systems. They take up a lot of our frame time and if we can just push it off, um, push logic and physics and everything else separate from the graphics, generally that would be a pretty good balance. And we just almost innately get at least a two times frame increase. Uh, so yeah, what's also cool about this triple buffering technique is that we're essentially lock free and wait free because the render thread and the main thread can update at their own pace without ever synchronizing with each other explicitly. Um, but there, and, and another thing is, is that a lot of people also do this, they try and break physics off so that you have a physics thread, a main thread, and a render thread. Uh, but if you're using triple buffering with this, oh my god, that would be a nightmare. Uh, so. A lot of people, they do the double buffering technique and they kind of like stagger uh, the system so that you have the main thread is in front and then you have physics followed by rendering. So rendering is like two frames behind, which is, uh, that, can, that can be aggressive if you want like a really fast response game. And the cons, yeah, lots of memory, and it doesn't really scale at all. Like, literally, you made a thread and you put some stuff on it, and if you have more cores, too bad, because it's not giving you anything. All right, so this next, uh, this next architecture is the synchronous task system. Uh, this is a multi-thread architecture. Essentially, it's very simple in its structuring. You just break a for loop into many for loops that run concurrently. It's a very like basic task granularity. Uh, every task is sort of supposed to be designed to be roughly the same size. So then you're not really worried about uh, load balancing. And, and the idea here is that things stay pretty synchronous. You break you take like a logic for loop, you break into a bunch of for loops, you accumulate the results of all the tasks, and you continue execution as a synchronous system would. Uh, and this is like, this is such an easy piecemeal thing to put into a component architecture. So I can see a lot of people just trying to do this to speed up, you know, some part of physics or, or graphics just really quick and, and make it happen. Though graphics is a pain in the butt, because we, like we said before, DirectX 11 is really the only graphics API that allows you to do that multi-threaded rendering and maybe like the newest version of OpenGL. So, uh, yeah, I kind of skipped past this part, I guess, but like a task, I think we all sort of, we all sort of have an idea of what the task system has, what its pieces are, but just to reiterate, uh, tasks are basically like a command they're very similar to um, actions in the action lists. And in fact, you should even think about them that way because in terms of logic structure, if you are doing something like a logic uh, task, you're gonna not wanna do a very large chunk of um, logic computations within the task frame. You want to kind of really combine the task 
command with almost an action list uh, uh, design around it because these tasks are meant to be parallel and thus it helps a lot to have also a, um, a frame-based parallelism on top of this sort of uh, thread-based parallelism. So, uh, yeah, and then task lists, uh, this is just a set of tasks that are executed in parallel. And we wait for a task list to finish, um, we sub but where we submit the task list to a scheduler. The scheduler grabs all of these tasks in the list, puts them on different threads, and uh, then we wait for it to finish. And while we're waiting, the main thread can just hop in and be like, hey, I'll just try and finish some tasks that I'm waiting. The main thread is just kind of spinning and uh, pulling off tasks. And so I, I don't think you really need a visual for that, but that's essentially this is what it does, right? You have your main thread, spawn some tasks, goes back to the main thread. Now, now here's kind of like an example of using a task list in terms of code is, say you have a for loop, uh, you have a task list, you're adding a new task, and maybe you have this like data, which represents some sort of array of objects that you're trying to operate on. Now you want to operate on a subset of that array. So you're trying to say, all right, like give me each subset, run into a task, submit all those tasks and wait. And then once you're done waiting, you can literally just grab um, the list of the tasks you ran from your task list and just pull data out of it. Uh, now, if you, some of you have seen task systems before, you'll notice what I'm kind of doing here is mixing things like futures and tasks. And I just feel like this is, makes it like way simpler. Like I don't know why people separate them. I feel like this is just a little bit more intuitive. You don't have as many classes you're dealing with. And if, if you do, uh, so you go back to the previous slide. When we got the task list, we're adding the task. This is actually my task is a class that's inheriting from the base task object. And uh, you can see that we're taking in some kind of data structure here, whatever. The really important part is that, like a command object, this has sort of an execute function that we're overriding. And anything that we put inside this run code is the thing that's going to be run on a separate thread. And, and it's important that these tasks are independently functioning of each other because they're going to be running on separate threads. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit about just how the scheduler works in kind of a visual way. I do have code samples that I'm going to put up after this lecture, uh, which actually demonstrate it in, in uh, you know, code. But here, let's, so we have a scheduler. We have a thread pool. The thread pool has three threads in it. And now, assuming that we have a four core machine, this makes sense because main thread is one of our cores, right? So we kind of exclude it from our thread pool. So we have a semaphore, and a semaphore is essentially an object that allows us to synchronize based a, a bunch of thread um, interactions based on, on sort of an integer. Essentially, a, a, a semaphore has a count. And the count can be between zero and some positive number. Uh, uh, when it's zero, no threads can grab the semaphore. When it's above zero, any number of threads equivalent to that count can grab the semaphore in parallel. And then um, the moment they grab it, the count of the semaphore is decremented. And the design that's ha happening here is we have these threads, they're all, all gonna like in parallel grab the semaphore, and then once they grab the semaphore, they're gonna grab at the task queue. And the reason we're using a semaphore here, because we do have a lock on the task queue. The task queue is being protected in a multi-thread fashion with thread saving. The reason we have the semaphore is because using um, with, with the OS, it likes everything to be in sort of this event-based mode. 
So our worker threads that are actually performing tasks are going to be uh, waking up threads and then grabbing the task queue. And then the thread's going to grab the semaphore, then the task queue. And then if there's no work left to do, the semaphore is what allows the thread to go to sleep. And then this will make it so that Windows doesn't hate us and like destroy our performance because of its uh, context switching. If we did a, a non-sleeping mode, we'd see a lot of problems, and uh, there are a lot of various forum posts on this sort of problem. Anyways, I, I talked a little bit too much about that. Okay, let's, let's go, let's look at what this does. Okay, so threads, I'll grab the semaphore. Let's say thread two and three grab the semaphore. The semaphore's count goes to zero. All right, now they uh, can both grab the task queue. Uh, one guy grabs the task queue, the cat goes down to one, he processes a task. Uh, oops. Hey, Bridget? Yeah. Oh, we got a question. Yeah, yeah, it's a question. Uh, when is the semaphore, like, uh, incremented in this? Because we have the task queue and then the semaphore. Uh, he wants to know, when is the semaphore incremented? The sem oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. So the semaphore is incremented every time you add task to the queue. Um, because the semaphore is essentially representing the task, how much is left in the queue. And once the task queue reaches zero, semaphore is also going to be zero, and that's going to mean that all the threads are asleep because there's no work. All right. Good. Yep. Right, we're good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So here, you have thread three grabs that task. Semaphore is at zero, task is at zero, no work to be done. All right, so, um, yes, yeah, so when we submit a task list to the schedule, we're really just submitting all tasks. The task list is just doing a little bit of bookkeeping um, to share a reference of how many tasks there are to each of the tasks. A count, um, which is stored inside the task list, and that each task, as it completes, can decrement that count. So the final task that decrements the count reaches zero, it is the one who determines that the task list itself is finished. Um, oh, and of, and of course, once it finishes, right, um, our submit and wait is completed, and the main it stops trying to process uh, tasks in its spin loop. Now, we can use the task system a lot of different ways in our uh, game engines. We can break up a lot of the physics phases into task lists. Uh, we can do our, uh, we can do certain variations of our broad phase. Uh, we can do the narrow phase, integration. We can do a lot of in parallel with physics, and with logic we can do it too, but we have to use message passing, so we're not just really, really change data, because that's what logic would do, is just like grab something and change data on it. We can change our own data, that's fine, but if it comes to another person's data, we have to queue a message up so it can change that data on itself later. And then of course DirectX can break up its rendering, but nobody does that right next to who cares. Um, so another cool trick um, that might be useful here is that actually avoid synchronization of the message passing because of the synchronous design of the sync task system. Again, similar to the render thread concept, we're just kind of sacrificing memory in order to avoid synchronization. So the way this works is, say we have a message handler. Normally we'll just have message queue, and then everybody would have to synchronize on that message queue. But we have a very unique situation that's happening when we're using a synchronized system. We have a bunch of writers that are all working parallel, but absolutely no one is reading the same data. And no one is really depending on the data that's being written until later on on frame. So essentially what we can do is each logic task can add their messages to a separate bucket based on their thread ID. And then that way, each 
format sort of the synchronously adding up to a peak, we don't have to worry about any sort of synchronization there. And then when the uh, frame comes around and we start trying to read the messages, the main thing can just read stuff out of the packet because, because of our synchronous nature, we know that the main thread is the one that starts up the test. Plus, if it's reading out of the bucket, no one is writing in it, no one is, you know, messing with it at all. So yeah, we just empty the buckets. Uh, now, one thing we're going to want to do too with our tasks is we're going to want to pull them because there's a fair amount of overhead in dynamically allocating tasks uh, all the time when you're trying to use them. Now, the moment we start pulling tasks, we're going to see the big problem with false sharing. Now this is because um, when you write to data, share the cache line with data on another port, validate cache line of the other port. And this is similar to the overhead of a cache mix. And because we're pulling stuff, right, we're literally putting tasks right next to each other in memory. And um, a lot Every one of these tasks is probably going to be on a separate thread. So the moment they write to their task data, they're going to be like, cash miss, cash miss, cash miss, cash miss. It's going to be ridiculous. Um, so just to illustrate that, if we look at, uh, we've got a thread pool, we have a bunch of cache lines that these uh, tasks end up in. Let's say our pool is maybe 32 each. Like, oh, we're saving memory. Yeah, we're being good. So every task can be no larger, uh, no larger than 32 bytes. Well, that's a big problem because modern cache lines are 64 bytes. So now we're loading in two tasks in different threads onto the same cache. So now whenever one of these tasks tries to write, it's going to be invalidating the other thread's task. So what we want to do is to basically just make sure that task pool is aligned to a cache boundary. Um, what we can do is we can just use like spec line 64 on our allocation structure. Or we can do, um, or sorry, along with that, we also do in a line alloc in a line three, just to hopefully show that even with the decal spec alignment, we're also getting sort of a uh, alignment with relation to where it's being allocated, not just with relation to itself and things near it. Okay, um, so the thing with, uh, oh, I changed this, whoops. So this should say pro instead of the how. Uh, so the pros of this system are typically the scalability. You know, you put the number of on your PC, all those uh, task loops are going to go a lot faster. It's simple to implement. I mean, you're going to see example code that is actually not a lot of code. Maybe like four files, maybe five files max, and uh, and, and and one of those files I don't think is even necessary anymore. Uh, it's easy to inject into your existing code, which is crazy cool because you can just take it in and take it out if you want. Um, and it's just crazy fast. It's like, it gives you a lot of benefits for not a lot of effort. Now the problem with this system, it limits your scalability because main thread is still kind of doing the in-between processing. So. You're not really uh, anywhere in between the actual task spawning. You're not getting any parallelism. So now the async system. And now you're going to have to forgive me on this one because this is a really complex system, and I haven't like made a really great one before. So I'm just trying to give you all the things that I think makes of it, but it's not be like a perfectly well-rounded um, discussion the same way to the previous one. I feel like I have a lot more confidence in that. So essentially with the async system, 
waiting has to complete. We're responding them, and we just let them go. They complete whenever they complete. And the idea is set, no longer have a main that's managing everything. Uh, the main thread starts out, and it sets stuff. But once it's set everything up, just becomes a of the processing threads, and now everything is always running in parallel. And ultimately, the, the sort of goal that we're maximizing our current. And so, so it sort of looks like this. We got logic tasks, and then you know sometimes they synchronize, and then physics and and some graphics stuff, and ask the again. And to get this to happen, we kind of have to add a little bit more luck to our task framework. Because what we're doing now is we're pipelining stuff, not just kind of uh, spinning stuff a lot and waiting for it to finish. So every task in task list now has to have a kind of a pointer to a task that might be coming after it. And you can just check, is next task null? If not, then schedule next task. Um, that is what I mentioned, they could start stuff up. Uh, and so the kind of idea here is that the main thread does this initial setup of what's what you might consider a graph of tasks. It's essentially just it's it's setting up sort of a, a pipeline, that chain of do all the logic tasks, do a sync, then all the physics, do a sync. So you have that skeleton, and then when you add entities, you're just injecting data into pieces of that. Now, the biggest problem with this phase is syncing because it, it kind of messes up the whole feel of the architecture when we sync because we're, we're essentially just simulating the same task system if we just sync. Um, and some main areas of syncing are, you know, entity creation construction, message handler, physics island creation, consistency. And the reason that these are causes sync cause syncs is because graphics wants to batch all its objects in a different way. Physics wants to batch all its objects in a different way. Message handling needs to occur separate of um, the logic tasks. Entity creation destruction has to occur separate of everything. Uh, so there's some there's some difficult. But here are the things I can make. Well, they're kind of cool. We have sweep and prune without coherence. And there's actually a paper that I read on this, which is uh, pretty awesome. It was, uh, it was written like in 2009, but I have a link to it, in, so you guys can check that out. Uh, physics integration, narrow phase. Not sure about collision resolution. I'm not really a physics programmer, but I feel like that might be able to be run in parallel. Uh, Animation, rendering, now that's again, rendering is DirectX 11. Animation, you probably want to do some of that on the GPU anyways. Uh, and then message handling and game logic. Message handling, because you sort your messages in a way, you can actually just uh, spawn a bunch of tasks to process the messages. And then game logic, of course, everything can run in game logic in parallel as long as you're doing message passing because there should be no dependency on anything. Every uh, logic component should be only changed in its own data. And so with these syncs, well, even though they have a pink but you can see that they, they have a this some kind of reason. Um, they're, Taking all the objects and they're rebatching them to make uh, to make the next set of tasks more efficient for the specific system. Uh, I'm also during the sync, we messages sent to their system. Uh, so if Logic sent a message to, like change the uh, full screen mode on for the window, that would probably be a message sent to the graphics system. So during that sync. 
ethics is going to have to handle the message. But uh, one tip that can be useful to be down these sort of massively concurrent systems is just using delay. Uh, and I guess you could argue that that's very similar to the sort of uh, logic physics render thread, having them all kind of separated by one frame each. This is the same idea. You can you want to make decisions about what pieces of the engine don't really have to happen to frame. Because that can help you by avoiding more sync than you want to do. For instance, adding remove entity in the book. We can actually do that, you know, over n number of frames instead of trying to add like thousand entities in one frame. And that's going to help us out a lot in terms of our uh, work distribution. Huh, I could have sworn I had enough slide in here about. Okay, well, if, if there's, huh, if there's anything else, you can ask me questions on it, I guess. Okay, so the, the pros of the asynchronous pass system are fast as possible implementation to 100% scalable because it maximizes your utilization all the cores. But if the problem is, is it takes just an incredible amount of thought, I guess that's in the cons, it takes an incredible amount of thought and intimate knowledge of how every game system works. As we have to understand what is writing to data, what is reading from data, what data is being shared, and we have to understand that in a both a global sense and a local sense. And just a, a big undertaking. So if you're not like willing to put up kind of big processing, you really are independent students using the same task system. But if you will all the way Okay. You, you cut out a bit there, can okay. you start the sense over again? Yeah. Um, let's see what we can. So, the big problem with a synchronous task system is it's just a big undertaking. You have to understand uh, how every system works of intimate detail and knowledge in order to get like the best pain for your buck on everything. You have to understand how it works in a global sense and in a global sense, because it's not just about how physics can be parallelized, it's how can it be parallelized with um, respect to every other system as well. So if you're not up to dealing kind of, I would say, uh, the sync task system, it's going to be a lot of for your book, and it's uh, like drastic since because you only have to really think about uh, whatever system you're trying to parallelize. Now, but if you're like me and you love current, you know, you know, weird problems, then uh, yeah, just go for it and just uh, be aware about what you're taking on. Be close in proximity to your graphics and physics programmer because you're going to have to talk to them constantly. All right, so here's some resources. Uh, Jeff actually gave me this one, uh, the cool concurrency tutorial. That's really awesome. The uh, guy walks through a bunch of uh, concurrency stuff, walks through primitives. He walks through uh, using into uh, race conditions and such. And uh, he's he, it's fundamental, but it's also uh, good to good to go over the multi-threaded weapon. Um, here's the paper link for that. Here's a blog post on a guy implementing uh, physics. Now, this is really cool because see him struggling sort of syncing problem. He's got an asynchronous syncing to him, and he's like really frustrated. And he's also. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what What's it, Ben? It's cutting in and out a little bit. Don't go over it. It's a little frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's uh, that's this great blog post. It is it is it, that's really interesting that it uh, talks about is with scheduling the 
on Windows, the quant or like a contact switch is about 10 to 6 seconds, which is absolutely horrific in game time. Uh, and the problem uh, using the semaphore, just the basic semaphore with the task scheduling, is the moment your tasks go to sleep, um, you might wake up the thread again to run some more tasks for one of your task lists. And you will just be in a context switch because the, uh, just the OS's um, granularity of time is just really large. And there, there's some discussion about whether it's worth it to try and, because there are functions that change the granularity of time, but then it also increases the speed which uh, Windows context switches you, which can also be bad. Um, I think the best option that's with discuss this block is to it's run into the problem, which I'll uh, don't just use the semaphore to base. And yeah, he's trying to. Right here, cutting out all the same incomprehensible. Can you show that again? <laughs> uh, what was the last thing you heard? All right, so, um, well, anyway, you know what, just, if you have any questions on this article, it's really interesting, and it's, uh, the problem uh, that he faces in this article is because he does not use yield processor in his spin loop. And that is a command that lets the OS know that you are doing loop and don't try and like brutally context you during it. Um, and then here, here's this article about false sharing. That's a classic article. And uh, here's my contact info if you guys have any questions or if you have like any solutions that you think could um, be or interesting, or like, you know, it's always fun to talk about this stuff. So, if you ever just want to talk about stuff, that's cool. Are there any questions? Yeah, I got one. Uh, so, uh, I guess when yeah. we're starting off, you start off with a second approach where there's a synchronized task system as opposed to starting off with the uh, How do you start, I guess, if you're going to write it in a certain engine? Okay, so, this question, uh, he says, he's assuming you're going to start with the second uh, synchronous task system as, as a good approach to start out. And he wants to know how to get started. Is that right? Yes. So, I'm going to be putting on a um, example of a simple synchronous task system. Basically, an exact replica of what I described in this lecture. Uh, and you guys can use that as a starting point and like, add whatever you want to it. It's not a lot of code. So I don't feel like super bad for giving it to you or whatever. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to get that up on a, a, a GitHub probably in a couple days, and I'll post that. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I have another one. Oh, you have one more? Can you give me an estimate yeah. like how much time it would take to turn in? Like, is this a summer project? Is this a year-long project? How long? Uh, so the question is, if you had an engine and you wanted to add writing to it, what, what estimate would you have in terms of uh, you know, manpower? Uh, like would it take, say, one summer to, to make a nice third engine versus a year or a week? So with the synchronous ask system, uh, it really depends on what is parallelizable in your system and what your bottlenecks are. Because like we were saying, right, if you don't have DirectX 11 rendering, this task system is not going to help any of your graphics bottlenecks. Also, if you don't have your own physics engine, or you're not willing to like, you know, break up a physics engine and change its internals, you're not going to get any sort of benefit on the physics side either. And those are your two biggest bottlenecks generally. So, I would say um, it really depends on if you are willing to write something like a DirectX 11 renderer, 
and a uh, have your own physics system because then you can really take advantage of the performance benefits. Any other questions? All right, thank you.